Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia. In today's Westpac address, my name is Sabra Lane. I am the club's president. I'm also the presenter of the ABC radio program AM. Today's guest is the leader of the Australian Greens, Adam Bant, making his first solo appearance here at the National Press Club. If you are following online, you can find us on Twitter. Our user handle is at Press Club AUST. Everybody, please join me in welcoming Adam Bant. Thanks very much, Sabra. Um, this is my first solo appearance. Last time I was here was with Bob Catter, and this is much better. Um, so thank you very much. I want to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people on whose land we meet today and acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging. And I also want to acknowledge our newest Senator, Lydia Thorpe, who was sworn in last week and who will bring fresh energy and a fierce determination into the Senate. She said loud and clear that the priority of restoring relations between our First Nations and settlers has to be a treaty and that recognition of sovereignty was never given away. We are the only English colonial country that doesn't have some form of treaty and recognition of ongoing sovereignty, and this can't continue. There remains widespread racism in this country. It's sometimes openly promoted in our media, but it's also quietly accepted and reinforced in our political decisions. It shows itself in our offshore detention policies, our isolated position alongside Trump in foreign affairs and our failure to respond to black deaths in custody. And I want to say clearly and for the record that I believe black lives matter and that the Greens believe black lives matter. When I became leader of the Greens, I said that we were facing three crises, the climate crisis, an inequality crisis and a jobs crisis. I also said the answer to all three is a Green New Deal, a government-led plan of investment and action that creates secure jobs by investing in a clean economy and making Australia more equal, including by getting dental into Medicare, making public schools genuinely free, and a renewable energy grid to power our country, process our metals, and export our sunlight as well. And now, as we start to emerge out of a pandemic that has seen the rich get richer, more than ever we need a great equaliser of public investment to transform our economy and our society. After a promising start of free childcare and real support for those out of work through JobSeeker and JobKeeper, the Coalition has reverted to type with cuts to these programs and a budget that will increase inequality and pull us deeper into a climate catastrophe. And tragically, Labor last week supported most of it. If you look at what they did and how they voted, rather than what they said in their speeches, last week was not a clash of ideas, but Labor and Liberal together fast-tracking billions of dollars to millionaires and big corporations, prolonging the recession and laying revenue-side booby traps for future governments. And that's why we desperately need an alternative vision for the country and a plan for the future that is a genuine alternative to neoliberalism. And today, in discussing the Greens' response to the budget, I also want to talk to you about the next plank in our Green New Deal plan, the unwinding of privatisation. But more on that later. It seems like a while, but it seems like forever ago, but less than 12 months ago, our country was actively debating the government's failure to act on the climate crisis. At the time, the Greens pointed out that Scott Morrison had done everything in his power to make last summer's bushfires worse and should bear his share of the blame for the country's terrible losses. And since then, we've all had to drop everything to deal with the immediate threat of the COVID crisis and the pandemic. And the Greens have been consistent backers of an immediate health first response to the virus, including pushing very early for upgrades to intensive care and for public investment in vaccine development. And faced with a, with a repeat of the Prime Minister's bushfire debacle as he went off to the NRL during the first wave, we joined with experts and state premiers in pushing the Morrison government to take the pandemic seriously. But while we've all been battling the pandemic, the climate crisis has gotten dramatically worse and Australia's pollution from gas drilling is rising. The COVID crisis is a disaster, but the growing climate crisis will be far, far worse. 
What the pandemic has shown us, though, is that if we act with urgency on the advice of experts, we can save lives and avoid unimaginable damage. But the evidence of the escalating climate crisis emerges daily. And here is just one example. Last month, a 110 square kilometre sized chunk of ice broke off from Greenland. And in the Antarctic, a crucial britain size hinge is melting so quickly that it may soon collapse. Now, this glacier alone would lead to sea level rises of half a metre just from this hinge, this glacier. But scientists call it the Doomsday Glacier because of how much ice it holds in place. If this glacier goes, the rest of the West Antarctic ice sheet could go, causing an irreversible three metre sea level rise, all during the lifetime of today's primary school students. And I lie awake at night, many nights, wondering what this means for my children. My daughter told me last week that she's going to have seven children and be an astronaut, a ballerina, a teacher and a mum when she grows up. Distressingly, though, an increasingly more plausible prospect <clears throat> is that when she hits 30, cities might be going underwater and large parts of the planet will be becoming uninhabitable. And the process may be irreversible by that point. And I just don't see how my daughters or anyone else survives to live a good life. And that tears me up inside. And that is why we are in a climate emergency. And that's why the government's actions over the last few weeks, including with this budget, are criminal. The government has been advised by the Bureau of Meteorology that Australia is on track for 4.4 degrees of warming under their current targets. And as a result, some scientists warn that on the current pathway, we will face a future world unable to sustain more than half of the current global population. This is a terrifying catastrophe, and it could lead to civilizational collapse during the lifetime of Australia's primary school students today. Scott Morrison's Paris targets mean 95% of irrigation farmers in the Murray-Darling Basin will be forced to leave or go bankrupt. Northern Australia will be uninhabitable from oppressive monsoonal heat and southern Australia will watch as the desert sprawls outwards. Instead of arguing about whether the Liberals will meet their 2030 targets, we should be pointing out what will happen even if they do. Currently, Australia's carbon budget will be blown by 2028. Delay is now the new denial. And Labor is aiding and abetting these climate criminals by abandoning 2030 targets, taking short-term action off the political table and letting Morrison off the hook. Giving people false hope that we don't have to act urgently is in many ways far more dangerous than outright climate denial. Now, I desperately want to turf out this government. And during budget week, Labor should have been with us fighting the government for climate action, for a green recovery. But instead, they backed in a budget that is all brown and trickle down, including the PM's gas rush. My plea to you in the press gallery is not to let the two establishment parties set the parameters of the climate debate by arguing over 2050 targets. The most important thing for reporting on the politics of climate is to follow the science about the necessity for action in the next 10 years, the critical decade. Because otherwise, we pass tipping points. The facts are, anything less for Australia than a 75% reduction by 2030 is simply not consistent with the Paris Agreement goal of limiting global warming to one and a half degrees. And anything less than 48% from now or 49% from after the next election is inconsistent with two degrees. If anyone has a target of less than 49% reduction by 2030, they are giving up on the Paris Agreement. Scott Morrison and Anthony Albanese's climate targets paid for and set by $9.3 million in donations from the coal, oil and gas industry will have us pass these tipping points, making global heating an unstoppable chain reaction. Currently, we're heading towards a cliff at 200 kilometres an hour. The Liberals want us to slow down to 180 kilometres an hour before we go over the edge, and Labor is arguing whether it should maybe be 150. In an emergency, you put your foot on the brake and you go off in a different direction. And this is the critical point. You do it before you reach the cliff edge. By 2050, it will be too late. 
Everyone ultimately reaches zero when you hit the bottom. Now, last week's budget should have been an opportunity to change direction and put in place a green recovery. The government could have followed Conservative Boris Johnson's lead in Britain, who's planning to power Britain's homes with wind energy, or look to Europe or South Korea, who are putting in place a green deal. And instead, we've been served up with another trickle-down trifecta of tax cuts skewed to the wealthy, massive corporate welfare, and a plan for high unemployment and stagnating wages for the next decade. Half of the so-called tax cuts for people on low incomes are not even real tax cuts, but a one-year only deal, a temporary extension of a tax offset for another year, while wealthy Australians, including people earning a million dollars a year, get twice as much in a permanent cut to tax. Meanwhile, stage three tax cuts remain legislated, voted for by Liberal and Labor, giving massive cuts to the super wealthy. These measures are all about winning the next election and not, as economists have pointed out, the best or fairest way to stimulate the economy or set us up for the future. Now, we know that this budget is built on a house of cards with unbelievable assumptions. But even if you are willing to accept the government's estimates, we are looking at more than 6% unemployment for years. That's at least 2 million people without enough work. This means our recovery is going to be slower than both the 1980s and the 1990s recession. Business profit share of income is at its highest in 60 years, and the share of workers' wages are at their lowest. And now the government is also choosing another decade of zero wage growth. Before the recession, the Reserve Bank said 4.5% unemployment was needed to spark wage rises. The Treasurer's 6% unemployment plan is also a plan to keep wages low and let big business pocket the windfall. And this, the most important budget of a generation, has screwed over the next generation. Instead of a proper jobs guarantee, as we proposed in April, the government's youth hiring credit plan will push young people into low-wage, insecure jobs. It will not create the jobs the government claims. This is just another transfer of public money to their corporate mates. This is a subsidy for McDonald's. Instead of giving young people decent jobs on nation-building projects that tackle the climate crisis and make Australia a more creative and caring place. But persistent unemployment and insecure work are not beyond our control. The Treasurer and the Prime Minister are deliberately choosing high unemployment and underemployment. With this budget and its commitment to debt, they could have chosen government-led investment to create jobs and boost aggregate demand, to drive unemployment down to a level of our choosing and create secure, well-paid jobs. But instead, Liberal and Labor have us going into debt to give millionaires a tax cut and McDonald's a handout. As someone who spent years representing low-paid workers before getting elected to Parliament, I know the damage done by insecure work. Under my leadership, the Greens will be a party that champions full employment and wage increases, which means we will fight for 2% unemployment rate, like it was on average between World War II and the 1970s, as well as 2% underemployment. And the Greens' comprehensive Invest to Recover plan, which I released in April and which we've distributed again today, is a roadmap for government-led job creation. By investing in big projects like half a million new public housing homes, free childcare, Australian manufacturing, 100% renewables and high-speed rail and other sustainable infrastructure, instead of bringing forward tax cuts that benefit the wealthy. Our plan would create 870,000 new jobs while tackling the inequality and the climate crises. Our Green New Deal takes its inspiration from FDR's New Deal, where the government was prepared to borrow to invest the country's way out of depression. And it's happened in Australia too. The immediate post-war period coincided with the highest levels of public debt on record. But a full employment strategy was pursued by government-led investment. Within a decade, of the shared prosperity that was created, public debt was reduced back to regular levels. And economic inequality was lower than at any time before, and sadly, ever since. It is entirely possible to do it again. But this time, the recovery must be pink as well as green. 56% of those who've lost their jobs have been women. 
but the government's recovery is all about business handouts and gas fields. And as we pointed out, opposing the Liberal and Labor two-tiering of JobKeeper, women are twice as likely to be in those low-hours sectors where support is being cut. And there was virtually nothing for women in the budget. The increased responsibilities for unpaid caring during the COVID crisis have been lumped on women, but free childcare has been removed. Now, there are two other essential components. The recovery must also start right now, capable of being expanded today, while also being ready to withstand a second or third wave of the pandemic. In short, the recovery must be green, pink, quick and safe. Fortunately, we have at our disposal a means of quickly providing jobs that is low emissions, will employ women, can be rolled out quickly and be, conform, uh, be performed in a COVID compliant way. It's called government. To meet very real community needs and to help get us towards full employment again, the Greens are calling for an expansion of the public and publicly funded not-for-profit sector. With Labor's backing, the government has outsourced the recovery. But right now, the most efficient way of creating jobs to get us out of this economic crater is to directly employ people. We don't need to go through big corporations or hope that money will eventually trickle down. In fact, the best way to get the private sector back on its feet is through public sector investment and lifting demand. If government doesn't step up now, the private sector recovery will take longer. A new approach is needed because on any measure, the last four decades of economic rationalism and trickle-down economics advanced by Liberal and Labor, what goes under the broad heading of neoliberalism, has failed. It has left us more unequal, less able to withstand shocks, and teetering on the edge of civilizational collapse. We've been told that the private sector can always do better, but the evidence just doesn't stack up. And the effects have been felt at every stage along this COVID crisis. We've had to rely on the army, the only growing sector of government employment, to do things that public servants once specialised in. This is what happens when you hollow out the public service to the big consulting firms who are even bigger donors. The second outbreak in Victoria was set off because quarantine, security management and contact tracing was privatised and outsourced. COVID was able to spread through workplaces because people either had no right to sick leave or were too scared to ask for time off. Meanwhile, our contact tracing system, as it said, was largely a patchwork of private contracts. Neoliberalism was the vector that spread this virus throughout my home state of Victoria. In aged care, all these neoliberal elements converged. Rampant casualisation forced carers to shuttle back and forth between providers, spreading the virus further and faster. We now have for-profit aged care homes legally obliged to improve profits. And in a sector that by definition is labour intensive, that means cutting costs, which can only come from reducing quality or, and safety or cutting staff. Likewise, high unemployment is great business for private job active providers who get to share in an estimated additional $210 million in payments from the recession. When we cast a longer look back, we can see that in these areas of aged care, employment services, private health, vocational education, contracting out of the public service, as well as in once publicly owned areas like electricity transmission, our essential services have delivered big corporations massive profit at public expense. The Greens estimate that in these six essential service sectors alone, the public has delivered big corporations $10.7 billion in profit. This is profit delivered either in the form of direct subsidies or through laws that let corporations force people to pay higher prices than they otherwise would. And I want here to repeat the crucial point. These aren't cor big corporations that have made their own way in the private market. They've grown rich by taking money from the public purse. Money that should now go directly to jobs, services and recovery. We also estimate from the budget papers that over the next year, in aged care, private health care, employment services, education, the public service and banking, where we bankroll cheap lending for the big four, too big to fail banks, 
the public will be delivering private entities $52 billion to prop up their profits. Add to this, the subsidy is going to prop up coal, oil and gas industries, and we see $99 billion a year is being shoveled upwards from everyday people into the pockets of big corporations. This money should be going directly into job creation and service provision, not to the profits of big corporations. It's time to wind back privatisation. The Australian people hate it and it has been a demonstrated failure. It's time to stop putting the big corporations ahead of people, to stop putting the millionaires ahead of the million unemployed. Introduced to Australia by Labor and furthered by the Liberals, neoliberalism has shifted wealth upwards while hollowing out the very public sector that we have relied on to get us through this pandemic. So although we are a party that prides ourselves on non-violence, today we declare war on privatisation. <laughs> we will seek the Senate's support for a wide-ranging inquiry into the failures of privatisation. Given the likely supportive views of the crossbench, we hope we can shame Labor into backing it so that it begins before the end of the year. This will be the first ever comprehensive inquiry into four decades of privatisation, contracting out and deregulating essential and public services. The review will help make the case for bringing some essential services back into public and community hands. It's time to chart a different course where the public comes first and where we put the millions ahead of the millionaires. With a Green New Deal, we can recover from the Great Recession and fight the climate crisis together and set our country up for the 21st century. In the coming months, leading up to what looks like an election year, we'll outline more elements of our Green New Deal. We know that people are increasingly sick of politics as usual and are ready for a fresh approach. We will make the case that the Greens are the only ones who can fix our country's problems because we're the only ones not taking donations from the corporations that are causing our country's problems. 10 years ago, the people of Melbourne elected me for the first time. With the Greens in shared power in the lower house and in the Senate, we used our votes to work with Labor. As a result, 2.7 million children have gone to the dentist with their Medicare card. We saw Australia's pollution drop at the fastest levels ever recorded while our economy continued to grow. And $13 billion was made available and invested in clean renewable energy through the CEFC and ARENA. Every parliament that I've been elected to, except one, was a tight parliament of a few seat majority, including the current one. Change in seat allocations in Victoria and Western Australia look to further reduce the coalition's lead going into the next election. But even without these changes, it would take a swing only of less than 1% for two or more seats to fall and we're back in shared power territory. This time around, the Greens will be pushing to leave neoliberalism behind, restore our essential services, pursue full employment, tackle the climate crisis and get the government to invest directly in job creation so that we can have a government, economy and a society that puts the millions ahead of the millionaires. Thank you.